Are you are you gonna finally tell us what what we're doing here? The flood have breached Argyle. I mean, I, I guess that much, but how bad is it exactly? It's an infected Spartan. Well, um, <clears throat> wait. I didn't even know that was possible. I mean, I know we're trained to deal with that sort of thing, but I didn't think it would ever really happen. That's because the UNSC want people to believe that we, that Spartans, are invincible. That not even the most dangerous force in the galaxy stands a chance. But the reality is, we're just as vulnerable to the infection as anyone else. Oh, shit. Shit. Halo Infinite Season 5 Reckoning released on October 17th, and the game's next major update is rapidly approaching, which means it's once again time for one of our regularly scheduled retrospectives, where I'll be going over all the major additions over the course of the last season, alongside providing a little review and providing my thoughts overall. Once again, rather than breaking this down chronologically, I'm instead going to break everything up into a specific category, as I think this genuinely just helps the format and pacing of the video. And what better category to start out at than what seems to be the clear favourite here on this channel, that being customization. Reckoning was the first full season that didn't release a single new armor core, however it took the time to instead flesh out most of the ones that already exist. And this is something that myself and many other players greatly appreciated. We got some amazing new cosmetics for the Mark 5B, the Mark 7, Rukshasa and Mirage, and an abundance of coatings that work on every core that exists in game. So although some definitely got a bit more love than others, every core definitely got a little bit of attention. But arguably the biggest thing in regard to customization this season was definitely the addition of cross-core helmets. Now, every helmet on any core is completely cross-compatible with every other armor core. Which, to put that into perspective, if you are a new player or someone that just really hasn't spent that much time in the game at all, by default you will have 8 different helmets that you can use with any of your armor. This is something that players have been waiting a long time for and I think the wait was more than worth it. For me personally, it's definitely helped me find a new appreciation for armor cores that I didn't like as much beforehand. Such as Chimera, where overall I wasn't a huge fan of the helmet selection, but now with Crosscore, I can use something like Yokai on Chimera and it fits surprisingly well. We did also see a few armor coatings be made fully Crosscore, which was also pretty great. Although it seems at the moment most of the choices are ones that were just on the store. In future, I definitely like to see the campaign ones specifically be made Crosscore. Especially considering the campaign is the part of the game you pay for and as far as unlocks for the multiplayer is mostly just coatings. So once they are made multi-use, I think that'll definitely give players a new appreciation for that and it'll add a little more value to the campaign itself as well. But it wasn't just armor that was affected by this as we also saw some weapon coatings become multi-use and even a few vehicle coatings too. The drawback here is that 343 went and increased the price of some of the older bundles to account for the new cross-core usage. And to be honest, I don't think this was a fair change. Cross-core should have realistically always been the attention, and 343 have definitely made this seem like the case for quite some time. So now that Cross-core is here and they've gone back and increased the prices on some of those bundles, it definitely feels a bit disingenuous. We've also seen a lot of the new bundles cost a lot more, and in some cases I think this is fine if the quality and quantity of the content is up to par with that pricing, especially in comparison to other live service titles, but there is a few and we'll probably talk about that a bit more in depth soon that I just don't feel like fit under that umbrella. But one final thing in regards to cross-core, Uni has confirmed as well that we should be seeing cross-core shoulder pads in the near future, so hopefully that is a feature that we see with the addition of Season 6. 
a couple days after I recorded the segment, they went and announced Crosscore Shoulders, so that's cool, I guess. Now, Crosscore's great and all, but what sort of new additions did we see added to the armor this season, especially since there wasn't any additional cores? Well, a good handful of the new cosmetics are available in the new 50 tier battle pass. And I know what you're thinking. 50? Aren't they usually 100 tiers? And you'd of course be correct. This season the battle pass was reduced by half of its usual amount, but this is down to the fact that you don't need to unlock coatings or emblems separately anymore. Beforehand you would have to unlock a coating for each individual core or for each weapon, and in the case for emblems you'd need to unlock it as a nameplate, as a weapon emblem, as a vehicle emblem, etc. However now they are all unlocked on the same tier. Despite that, I'm still really not a fan of this change, and I think it could have been done much, much better. It feels like overall this is the most emblems we've seen in a battle pass, and it's clear that in certain areas the quantity of items that we unlock has been massively reduced. Even in terms of something like helmets, last season we had 7, in season 1 we had 11 different helmets I believe, whereas this time around there's only 4. Now let me clarify, to be fair, we don't necessarily need a load of helmets or something along those lines in a battle pass as long as the items we get are pretty good, and the armor we do get in this battle pass is pretty damn good. We saw the return of some fan favorite helmets such as EOD, Security, and Gungnir. Although Gungnir does look quite different from its original counterpart, this has likely just been done to help it stand out a bit more from Stormfall. And I know this is probably going to be a little bit of a hot take, but I kind of prefer Infinite's Gungnir. But we also saw some really cool new stuff, and this is one of the main selling points of this season, being the Flood Armor. The first piece of this armor is unlocked at tier 20, being the Defiled Hope chest piece. And if you played when the season launched, this was originally free up until the release of the first event. You don't unlock any more Flood Armor up until tier 41 with the unlock of the Defiled Cap knee pads, alongside some shoulder pads, the Defiler helmet which looks awesome. All of the Flood Armor is like modified things that were already present on the Mark 5B. As you can see, Defiler is a Flood Infected Mark 5B helmet. You do also get a wrist attachment, a helmet attachment, there's an armor effect in there and a mythic effect set alongside some pretty cool coatings. But at the end on tier 50, you'll notice something quite interesting, this being the Rasulka armor kit. We have of course seen armor kits in the past and usually they felt like a bit of a waste of a tier, but this time around the kits are a little more interesting. With Rasulka specifically, you'll notice some really cool pieces of armor that unfortunately you can't use on your own Spartan not even the helmet. However, these kits can be modified. You can change the coating, the visor, you can apply an emblem and even apply armor effects. And there is a few other kits and we'll touch on them very shortly. But Rasul kit is the only one of these in the battle pass and it was the final unlock. And like I said, it does look absolutely phenomenal, but I can't help but feel disappointed that we can't use those shoulder pads or that infected scout helmet with our own armor because they look so good. In terms of things that were released on the store, we saw a bunch more coating specific bundles, but also some cool armor sets. We had the return of Pilot in its own bundle, alongside being featured in the combined arm super bundle. There was some Rikshasa armor sets released at some point. We had a few sets for Mirage. A couple of other Flood armor sets, some cool Christmas cosmetics. But the biggest thing to release on the store over the course of the season is easily the Combat Evolved Mark V armor kit, which was released to celebrate the franchise's 22nd year anniversary. This bundle gave you access to the Combat Evolved Mark V kit alongside two armor coatings and a visor, for the pretty high price of 2,200 credits. This was of course a very controversial release. Most people agreed that it looks absolutely gorgeous, however a lot of players expected it to be free. Now personally I would have much preferred if this had been an armor core, because again the fact that I can't really customize it bar changing its colors does leave me feeling a bit disappointed. I had seen some people make the argument that oh well in combat evolved you could only change the colors anyway, however to that I'd say this isn't combat evolved. But despite the controversy surrounding this item, it did end up being like the top selling item in the store, and when it released you saw almost every single player was running around with it. Do I agree with its pricing? Well, of course not, but I can't lie, the armor looks gorgeous. And funnily enough, it probably wouldn't be the worst thing that released this season based on its pricing, as we also had the Transgressor armor kit, which released for the same price, but it only gave you the armor kit and a single coating as opposed to the two coatings and visor that we got in the Mark V bundle. Transgressor again looks great, it's this flood infected version of George, and the coating itself looks fine, 
but for the price, it's definitely not worth it. There was one more armor kit released this season, and this wasn't one that was paid for, in fact it is actually completely free, and that is the Halo Infinite Mark VI, which is an armor kit for the Mark VII core, just like the Combat Evolved kit, but to unlock this you need to reach Hero Rank, which from my understanding is like the equivalent of over 9 million player score. It is a pretty fitting reward for reaching that level, and the kit looks great, but again this is something that I really wished was a core. And to see it released as a kit is a little bit underwhelming. I think it's great that we do now have a reward for the progression system for reaching the final rank, but I still feel like there should be more tied to it for some of the other levels too because as a whole the progression system does feel quite empty. I did do a video talking about my thoughts and why I believe it is quite lacklustre earlier on this season, so I won't delve into that for too long, but the progression system is something that I'd like to see 343 build on more in future. There was of course some other free items released in this season's events. Events were rebranded to Operations. These were now 20 tiers as opposed to the regular 10 tiers and they lasted much longer. They were also no longer challenged based and could be leveled up like your regular battle pass, but when an operation is equipped you can't level up your battle pass alongside it. Again this is a change I'm very mixed on, on the one hand I think it's great that these are around for much longer as it gives people much more time to complete them, in fact they are technically permanent as even if you do miss out you can pay 500 credits to own the operation or pay 2000 to unlock everything that it contains. But based on the two operations we've had, they feel quite lacklustre, especially in comparison to the five events we had last season that contained some amazing cosmetics for the Yoroi core, we had some cool weapon models, some really nice coatings, and the items we got on these were great, we had a nice chest piece for Rukshasa, two really good helmets with Scorn and Winter Knight, there was plenty of cross core coating, so it's some really good stuff for players that don't want to spend any money on the game, and it did give you plenty of time to unlock these things for free. But because they function more like a battle pass, even if you brought the battle pass of that season, you only have access to three challenge slots as opposed to the four that you have when you own a pass. Which means if you want access to your fourth challenge slot while trying to complete an operation, you will need to pay the 500 credit fee. And they do both come with a bonus reward, you get a coating with both that is on every armor core. So the 500 credits that you do pay doesn't seem that bad, especially in comparison to most of the coating bundles we get on the store which are 800 each. But still, these events have an absurd amount of filler containing mostly emblems, double XP boosts and backdrops. And I get why those things are included, especially again for players that probably don't spend any money on the game, or even new players that won't have an absurd amount of double XP boosts like I know a handful of us do. So I just feel like maybe these operations should be a bit longer in length, or contain a bit less filler. Maybe swap an emblem out for a pretty nice stance, as I don't think we had any release this season. And there was more than just cosmetics released with these operations, but that's something that we'll talk about later on. Ultimate rewards this season were also extremely underwhelming, mostly being made up of emblems or weapon charms, and I think overall we only had two armor coatings and one weapon coating, although there was a pretty nice utility piece at some point for the Mark V-B. Still, this is probably the most I've skipped out on ultimates in quite a while, and I think it'd be really cool if 343 maybe used some of the cut cosmetics, or I should say unreleased ones, like the little mouth attachment for the Cavallano helmet, or some of the various other helmet attachments that haven't been released. Despite there not being any new armor core, this was a very good season as far as customization goes, mostly thanks to the cross core additions, and a lot of the new items we saw released do look absolutely astounding. Despite that, there is some very clear issues like the increase in prices, the kits feeling extremely limited, the battle pass and events having an extreme amount of filler, but I do think the positives outweigh the negatives. There was a solid output in regards to free content. We did have two free events and there was 20 free tiers in the battle pass which did contain some really nice stuff. And FOMO in regards to the event specifically did feel like it was reduced. But with the battle pass when the first operation was released the free items in there now all became premium. So if you hadn't already unlocked them you would need to buy the battle pass if you wanted them. Issues aside however, I think it's completely fine because I can now use Deathly Poison with the Yokai Helmet. Man, I just love the battle rifle. Right? It's the best! Totally! There isn't a single weapon in the game that comes close to how versatile and useful it feels. Especially in ranked. I hope they don't make anything else the starting weapon. Nice. They... they changed the starting weapon to ranked. 
Huh? What? Oh yeah, um, so you know the bandit rifle, right? They changed it to the bandit? Sorta. Free before we actually added a new weapon. <clears throat> the bandit Evo. A what the hell is a Evo? bandit Evo? This is the greatest day of my life. As far as sandbox additions go, honestly, this season was pretty lackluster. Upon launch, we did receive a new weapon variant, that being the Bandit Evo. It's a scoped version of the Bandit with some slightly modified statistics, but thanks to it having a scope, it does feel a little more in line with the classic DMR. This was actually made the starting weapon for rank, and to be fair, it's pretty fun to use. It of course doesn't carry the same excitement as a completely new weapon, but it was nice to have some form of weapon variant. But this is of course not the only new sandbox edition, as with the mid-season update, we would also get the repair field, and let me show you how this works. Come here, Cabby. So once a player has taken damage... Ouchies. You just throw down the repair field. And look at that, as good as new. But my toe is still missing. You'll walk it off. Overall, I'd say the repair field was a pretty solid addition. I think it's really fun using a scorpion, watching it get almost obliterated, then chucking a repair field on it and watching it go straight back up to full health. And the fact that it attaches to vehicles too, I think is pretty fun. And that you can basically just throw it onto a player's face. It's pretty similar to the Regenerator from Halo 3 and the heal power-up that we saw in Halo 4. This does mean that it doesn't just heal your teammates, but if enemies are within its area of effect too, they will also be healed. So if you're trying to use one to save yourself in close quarters combat, it might not be as useful as you'd think. But in a way, it sort of gives you the ability to play as a medic, which I think is pretty fun. Now, if you want to get super technical, there was technically one more sandbox edition this season, which was there at the update's launch, but it's kind of an odd one. If you play on one of the new maps, Forbidden, which we'll talk about soon enough, specifically on the infection game mode, and press the buttons on the floor in a specific combination, you would open a door, and this door would lead to a room that holds a special golden sandwich. Hmm, yes, but uh... What are the lore implications of this? My sandwich! The sandwich doesn't really do much, and the fact that you can only get it in infection is kind of funny. But this is the kind of easter egg that I think we all love to see, and I would definitely like to see more of it in the future. As far as maps go, we did of course have quite a few additions, some dev made and some made by the community. And since we already brought it up earlier, I'm going to start off by discussing Forbidden. Out of the three dev-made maps released, this is definitely the more competitive tuned of the bunch. It has a pretty linear design being made up of a bunch of corridors, and initially upon first playing it, it might seem like quite a large arena map, but I think once you've gotten used to the movement, it doesn't feel so bad. Especially when you remember that it's designed for a mode where players start with ranged weapons like the Bandit Evo, and there is of course an abundance of ranged precision weapons around the map. And genuinely, despite not being a competitive player whatsoever, I really like Forbidden. I think visually it is gorgeous, and to play on, it's really fun too. I don't think it's my favourite by any means, but it was one that I did end up appreciating much more as the season went on. And it has the sandwich easter egg, so that is an immediate win in my book. Next up is Prism, and this one is definitely quite interesting. Design-wise, it's stunning. It takes place in a banished mine on Saban, and you'll notice that the map is covered in Blamite geodes, which you can actually destroy, and they'll explode into a bunch of needles which will track down players as long as they're close enough, of course, which will usually lead to a super combine effect eventually killing them. As far as power weapons goes, it has your typical sword, sniper, skewer, or hammer, but interestingly, in the middle of the map, it actually features one of the campaign weapon variants, that being the pinpoint needler, and this feels much more useful than any of the other power weapons on the map, due to its extremely quick time to kill, and the fact that you're usually pretty close quarters. Essentially, if for some reason you are yet to try out this version of the weapon, it's like the needler on Mega Steroids. It even actually has the capability to lock on two players at once. Overall, in terms of gameplay, I think Prism is one of the most chaotic maps in the game, and one of the most creative. Visually, like I say, it's an absolute masterpiece. And it's up there for one of the most visually gorgeous maps in a Halo game. 
That being said, I don't think I enjoyed my time on here as much as I did something like Forbidden. That could just be a skill issue on my part, or it could just be down to the fact that I think overall I just had worse matches. Of course, I'm not someone that spends a ton of time in Arena, so maybe it's something I just need to better adjust to. Now, the third dev made map is actually a bit of a familiar location, as we'll be heading over to the House of Reckoning. This isn't a map that is actually played in typical matchmaking, however, you can play regular modes on it through custom games, and honestly, it's surprisingly fun. There's not really a ton to say about it, we've all seen this location, we've played through it in the campaign. I would like to see 343 reuse more campaign locations as multiplayer maps, I think that would be really cool. And it's something we've seen in the past anyway, as most of Reach's maps are usually locations that were in the campaign. So it would definitely be cool if it's something that Infinite utilises more. But yeah, as a whole, there's not a ton to say about the House of Reckoning, other than the fact that it's a pretty fun addition, and I'm glad it's here. Now earlier on, I actually can of lied as there was a fourth dev made map this being Snowfire. However this isn't really a new map and more so just a variant of live fire that was added with the release of the Winter Contingency 3 operation. So as far as gameplay goes it doesn't really play much differently to live fire if at all and since it didn't have its own playlist I've only actually played on this properly once and it was in a custom game of infection with some members over in the discord and the only reason I did that is like I say down to the fact that it didn't have its own playlist playlist like most new maps usually do. With Winter Contingency 3 there was no specific game mode so the only way to play on Snowfire was to hopefully get it in an arena matchmaking playlist and since there is a ton of maps in those I was not sitting there and waiting for my chance to play on it. I will say I was again really glad this was included. I do wish there was a few more Christmas maps maybe a big team battle one since we didn't have any big team battle maps this season not even any community made ones there was no BTB or squad battles maps at all Every Everything that was released was completely for Arena, and like I say, I'm glad that we got a Christmas map with a Christmas event, but as a whole, it was really underwhelming. Not design-wise, I think it looks completely fine, exactly how you'd expect it to, but more so in the quantity. But then, with the release of the Combined Arms event, we got the release of the Halo 3 Refueled playlist. And the new maps are amazing! They tickle all the right places with my nostalgia! Did I read that right? But skill-based matchmaking sucks! Yeah, and then 343 changed the weapon starts to the battle rifle, and everything's now more sweaty. Just admit you're bad at the game! Never! <laughs> Dude! Oh my god! Gosh darn it. Now this playlist actually released eight different maps, all of which were community made, and these include Sylvanus, which is a remake of Guardian, The Pit, which as the name implies is The Pit, Isolation, High Ground, Domicile, which is a remake of Construct, Banished Narrows, Cliffside, which is a remake of Lockout, and we also got a completely original map being Critical Dewpoint. The playlist was to celebrate Halo 3's anniversary, but also the new collaboration between Halo and Mountain Dew, and overall was a pretty popular addition. Now again, as I've already stated multiple times, I'm not a huge arena fan, I'm much more of a BTB player, but I do think as far as the maps themselves go, all of them were pretty damn good. But I can't lie, it would have been nice to maybe have like a sand trap in there. Not in the Halo 3 Refueled playlist of course, but maybe one or two Halo 3 BTB maps, or an extra addition to Squad Battle could have been nice. Either way, this was a very welcomed playlist by the community. There was, of course, a ton of arguments regarding the skill-based matchmaking and the overall sweatiness of the playlist. It did release with AR sidekick starts, but that was later changed to Battle Rival. So in the end, it ended up feeling much more like a ranked playlist as opposed to a social one, which from my understanding is what it was originally designed to be. That did make it feel a bit more in line with Halo 3, but personally, I'm a firm believer that social starts should be Assault Rifle Bandits like they are in regular BTB, as I think that overall loadout just works better better for social gameplay. The original map, Critical Dew Points, does actually feature a pretty funny easter egg. If you go up to some of the glowing green vending machines and interact with them, it will give you a temporary speed boost. Which to be fair was one of the most social elements of the playlist and I'm glad this was included. It's great being able to just rush across the map especially on like a zone based mode and just reach your enemy and they don't even realise that you're there. My issues with the playlist aside, like I say, all the maps are amazing and I'm super glad they were included. I would love to see more celebration playlists like this in the future, maybe one for Combat Evolved, Halo 2, Halo 4, Halo 5. They could do one for Reach. Hell, they could even give us a firefight playlist with locations based on Halo 3 ODST. And speaking of firefights, I think it's time we move on to our next category.
When it comes to game modes, this is probably where Season 5 shined the brightest. At launch, we got the release of Extraction, which is a returning mode from Halo 4, I believe, where of course you need to place an extraction device in a zone in order to score a point. Now, personally, this mode itself I didn't find to be anything too special. I do think we have way too many zone modes right now. Although it does definitely have some extra elements to it due to the fact that you have to actually convert the zone by converting the device and you have to actually place the device as opposed to just standing in the zone. So it does add a bit more strategy to it and in a lot of ways it adds a bit more teamwork as you have to cover your teammate that is placing the zone as they are completely unarmed during that placement process or conversion process. But again, as I've already stated, I'm not a huge arena fan, so this isn't one that I necessarily spent a ton of time with, nor is it one that I particularly enjoyed much. However, I think it would be really cool to get a squad battle or big team battle version of Extraction, just to again give those playlists a bit more love. And although Extraction itself wasn't anything too exciting in my opinion, the season launch did come with the addition of Forge AI tools, which, if you weren't aware, means that players could now basically create their own firefight experiences, you could make your own sort of campaign mission, you could do a bunch of stuff using the enemy AI that was used in the campaign, and this was a great addition, and there were so many community-made experiences that were released that are absolutely amazing, so many really fun operation type missions there was a lot of firefight type ones and this was definitely great for holding the community over until 343 released firefight with the mid-season update firefight this time around just like it always seems to be when it's released in a game was a little bit different as this time it was firefight king of the hill mixing two fan favorite modes into one now you would be defending a zone from the banished who are also trying to capture the point and it released with two difficulties. You had Normal Firefight and Heroic. Normal Firefight would let players respawn within 30 seconds, and overall would just be a lot easier. As for Heroic, it would take an entire minute for your teammates to respawn if they are down, or for you to respawn if you go down. Both featured Bandit Evo and AR starts, but 343 did add Legendary Firefight, which was instead Assault Rifle and Sidekick, and didn't allow you to have infinite equipment like the other versions of the mode did. And also, there was no timer on the respawn, so if you went down, you would be relying on someone to revive you. Every time you successfully capture a hill without any of your teammates going down, it applies a skull, which in some cases can make a match much more difficult, but you are rewarded as you gain more score by the time that hill is captured and you get more XP at the end of the match. Personally, I think Firefight King of the Hill is a lot of fun, and I think I prefer it to the typical wave-based Firefight experience. I think it does a great job at mixing that, but adding an extra objective to it to give it a little bit of extra flair. And it also encourages the combat in a specific part of the map, as opposed to just players randomly running around, not really fighting together, just fighting enemies wherever they're spawning in. I know that doesn't really apply to every game of Firefight, of course, but still, I do like the King of the Hill style. That being said, I do think the mode is currently lacking in variety as far as the waves go. I think the waves feel way too similar, and we definitely need some other stuff, even if it's just the banished occasionally using vehicles, or having a wave where it's entirely just sentinels. Stuff like that would be a lot of fun, because right now it does feel like I'm seeing the same enemies, the same bosses showing up quite a lot. But as a whole, it was just very nice to finally have a PvE experience for players to enjoy that you could, of course, level your battle pass up from. And 343 did end up updating the challenges too so that you could complete them pretty easily in both PvE and PvP, which is something that I definitely appreciate. As most of the time, you can now get almost every single one of your challenges done in this mode. Occasionally, you might have to jump onto PvP to do your ultimate reward though. Don't get me wrong, it would be nice to see a classic firefight integrated at some point. But as it stands, I'm pretty content with Firefight King of the Hill. The next thing for me would be incorporating some PvPvE modes. Maybe something akin to Warzone from Halo 5, where it's maybe players defending bases or just fighting each other while the campaign AI is involved in some capacity. Because I think that would be great in creating a fun, casual, but still somewhat competitive experience. So Spoopy, tell me. What are your thoughts on Firefight? Honestly, Firefight is one of the best modes in Halo Infinite. It's such a great way to gain more XP for your ba battle pack. Is he going to be okay? I'm sure he'll be fine. I've been playing Firefight so much my wife left me. And next, let's ask Halobox Studios what he thinks about Firefight. Oh.
So Taz, tell me, what are your thoughts about firefights in Halo Infinite? No, man, I really like the firefight mode. I just wish there was friendly fire. What? There was one other mode that was added this season that honestly I kind of entirely forgot about until reading through my notes for this video, and that is Big Team Infection. This is infection on Big Team Battle Maps with 20 players, four of which are the starting infected. And although this is something that I feel like I wanted when infection released, the way it was executed I just didn't find myself enjoying it all that much. Again, I think it falls under the same issue that I had with Infinite Infection anyway when it released. I just don't think the maps work very well for it. They're not designed for that kind of game mode. So maybe if eventually we get some Infection maps integrated, I'd like to see this map come back with maps that better suit the mode. It was a fun addition, don't get me wrong. I think it was added as a workshop playlist, so it hasn't returned in quite some time. And it's not one that I'd be against them bringing back, but I just think it needs a better map pool and probably some changes that would suit the mode a bit better. And with that, I think we've gone over all of the main additions. Of course, there was a few other things like the improved networking model, which is currently in testing. It was a part of the new squad battle playlist, which was exactly the same, but now featured the new networking model. And overall, I think the reception to that has been pretty positive. That has also been incorporated into Firefight permanently, and we'll likely see it be used more and more in the future, which is good. There was also some new Forge canvases added, which I was going to mention in the map segment, but I just didn't fit it in. I think this season did a great job at expanding on Forge, once again proving that Infinite is the most impressive version of it. It expanded on the customization a ton too, which I greatly appreciate, and we got some really fun game modes. We finally got Firefight, and I think it was genuinely a great season for the game. Despite that, there is some clear issues, like I've mentioned with some of the price increases, the way that some of the playlists and some of the events have been handled, but I have had a lot of fun with Season 5. So overall, I reckon I'd give it an 8 out of 10. I honestly don't know where I'd actually stack up compared to the prior seasons, and at some point I'll probably do like a little tier list. Mostly because I think with some of the newer content, my perspective and opinions on some of the older updates have kind of shifted a little bit. Content update 29 is just around the corner, and I cannot wait to use the Mark IV armor and try out the new arena map. But since 343 is ditching the typical seasonal model, I'm honestly not 100% sure how I'm going to handle these retrospectives going forward. Anyway, I think that sums up everything that I really need to go over today. This video has been in the works for a lot longer than I feel like it should have been, but hopefully it's been worth it and it's been something that you've all genuinely enjoyed. Thank you all for making this past season and these past few months enjoyable. We've been able to accomplish so much that I really never thought I'd be able to achieve. I hosted multiple tournaments, we reached some crazy milestones. And I am genuinely so thankful that I've been able to grow this community. So I just want to close off on a big thank you to all of you. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Thank you.